Good afternoon, everybody. Okay, everybody in? Everybody ready? Hi, my name is Steve Dryden, and I am with the Friends of Pierce Mill in Washington, D.C. We are the nonprofit group that um, partners with the National Park Service and restored the Pierce Mill, which is right down the street. Some of you may saw it yesterday when you were at the Grain Fair. And if not, please come visit us sometime. We are the last mill operating in Washington, D.C. There used to be eight of them on Rock Creek. They all got washed away, but ours survived. And uh, I've been working with the Friends of Mill for more than two decades. And um, for me, it was a real gift and blessing to come across this. I was uh, a journalist who was uh, watching computer screens way too much, and I said, I want to get outside. So it just so happened that somebody was starting a nonprofit to help restore the mill. It had broken down big time back in the 90s. And so I joined the group and we succeeded in getting the money raised and we got the mill operating again in 2011. Now before it had broken down in the 90s, it was actually milling all types of grains for a sale. And how they got away with that, I don't know, but they've been doing that since the 1930s as an educational historic site. The real mill, the Pierce Mill, had actually closed down in the 1890s, but the Park Service revived it. It's one of the first preservation projects of the New Deal in the 1930s, and it actually sold all these flowers. But when we got going again, Park Service didn't want to be bothered with um, fooling around with flour and worrying about it lawyers and that sort of thing. So we don't do that. We just grind corn and we show people how it works, which is education in itself. So today we're really thrilled to, to be here and glad you all are here to talk about stone ground milling in 2023. Um, I have to say even I've been surprised at the way the movement has grown, the uh, popularity of the stone ground mills has grown. A lot of it's due to one of our panelists here. But I'll just run through the um, the group of panelists first, and then we'll get started with presentations. Um, on my immediate left is Ian Herbsmark. Ian is the uh, founder of the Migrash Farm <coughs> in Maryland, and he has been out there for several years, right? More than a, yeah, yeah 2015. Um, and he also has a mill, a small mill on site. Which brand do you have? Uh, so, uh, Meadows and New Rivers. He has the Meadows and New Rivers. Um, next to him actually is the mill man. This is Andrew Hein, who is the founder of New American Stone Mills in Vermont. They are the ones that actually quarry very granite from Vermont and fabricate it into these millstones of various sizes. And then we'll, uh, they put together a mill itself, which we'll see on the photographs here, but a mill that then you can install in your bakery or elsewhere. And it does the same job that the millstones in a historic mill does. Next to John, uh, to Andrew is Jennifer Lapidus, who is the founder of Carolina Ground in Western, the hills of Western North Carolina. You've heard from her this morning if you were here at the uh, presentation, but um, Jennifer is a uh, baker first off and then decided that she had to find a way to deal with the wheat market and the pricing and everything else, so she decided to start grinding flour herself, and she uses one of Andrew's machines also. Next to Jennifer is um, Aaron Rigsby. Hi, right, Aaron. And Aaron is with Woodson's Mill, which is down in Roseland, Virginia, right south of Charlottesville. Um, Woodland's Mill is an incredible testament to the staying power of mills. It's uh, probably 200 years old or more. I think the current iteration was 1840 when they built that, yeah. So this is an actual stone, um, you know, actual working 
water-powered mill, which also has some modern equipment. We'll tell you about that. But they are actually making a product that they market through the Deep Roots uh, company that he and two other fellows founded. And then further on the left is Mr. Jonathan Bethany, who I know many of you know, but Jonathan is um, a baker extraordinaire and a miller um, at his bakery down in Shaw in Washington, D.C. And he um, is a uh, former a uh, colleague out of the Bread Lab in Washington State. He worked also at the Blue Hillstone Barn up in New York and came here a few years ago and started this incredible bakery, Salo, which um, he'll tell you more about. So we're going to get started today with um, sort of an overview from our panelists to talk about their approach to what they do and how they do it. Um, uh, actually, I forgot the great quote that we're going to start out with here from Amy Haller. Anyway, you know her book, The New Bread Basket. Um, I kind of amended this just to make it more to what I wanted it to say, but I'm sure she'll forgive me that um, you know, coffee roasting and, and you know, local coffee roasting is probably uh, something that you know we first got into 30, 40 years ago and it was kind of weird and people couldn't believe it was being done, but she points out, you know, okay, so now we know about what good coffee is based on good coffee roasting. And so maybe 30 years from now, we're gonna have more small grain mills um, everywhere in this country and actually have decent flour. So that's the inspiration from Amy. And this is the map, I've distributed as many copies as I had. This is the map that just gives you an idea of the extent of both the historic mills, which are in red, and the bakeries, distilleries, and other sites that are using stone ground equipment currently. And this is from North Carolina in the lower left-hand corner up to Pennsylvania and Delaware in the right. And, you know, this is just about maybe, I don't know, 50% of what I could have had on this map. And that's an extraordinary testament to everybody here, but, you know, especially to people like Andrew who have provided this equipment so many, to so many different enterprises and have really changed the game. So, we're starting with New American Stone Mills. Andrew, take it away. Hello. Hello. Um, uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Thanks for the, to the Common Grain Alliance for bringing me out here. Um, I just talked to my wife this morning and we had our first inch of snow. Um, so it's kind of nice to be here where it's still sunny and uh, green <laughs> and enjoy a little bit more of the fall weather. Um, so my wife and I started a wood-fired bakery back in 2004 called Elmer Mountain Bread. And as part of that bakery, we kind of fell into it. We were both cooks and not planned on the bakers. And uh, the guy was running this little bakery and said, hey, do you know anybody who wants to take over a bakery and buy a house? And so we came and checked it out and we had about three weeks to learn how to mix, shape, bake, uh, do QuickBooks and all that kind of stuff. Um, and one of the ways we figured out how to do that and get better at it was reaching out to other wood-fired bakers. Um, that particular oven was an Alan Scott oven, um, which uh, Jennifer has a lot of uh, familiarity with. Um, and with this sort of community that we started to develop of, of different wood-fired bakers, we figured out how to make the business work and, and improve the oven until it eventually fell apart. And I set about to build a new wood-fired oven um, that was in 2010, I think, <clears throat> um, after running the business for about five or six years, and reached out to all those wood-fired bakers, and I said, what would you improve? How would you make the oven better? Um, what would you, um, you know, how can we keep doing this sustainably? So we built a, a bigger wood-fired oven with the help of um, uh, a mason and a lot of inspiration. and. Uh, in the process of building that, all these bakers started to come to us and say, hey, what's up with your oven? Can we come check it out? Um, one of those bakers was Evram from Sub Rosa, 
Um, Dave Bauer has been mentioned a couple times from Farm and Sparrow, also came out and ended up building, uh, having the same kind of wood-fired ovens built. Uh, fast forward a few years later, I got to be good friends with Dave and, and said, hey, um, I'm kind of interested in taking on a new project. I'm, I really want to start stone milling. And he said, well, um, I work with the Osti Roller Mill, and this is what I like, this is what I don't like. But I really have been looking for somebody who would build a horizontal stone mill using natural granite stones in a new way, because nobody's building them that way in the US right now. So because I had some oven building experience and curiosity, I set about with a, another friend in North Carolina to, to figure out how to build a mill. And uh, a lot of that was from books uh, that the Society for the Preservation of Old Mills um, reprinted, um, and also just some help from some engineers and, and welder friends. Um, built our first mill and, and transitioned to uh, using white roller mill organic flour to all stone ground flour. And um, we can talk more about what that process was like, but um, eventually moved our wood fire bread bakery to using all st fresh stone ground flour um, and then eventually connecting with Vermont farmers. And in the last, over the last five years, our bakery has been able to um, use all, all grain sourced from Vermont, most of it within 50 miles of our bakery. <clears throat> Um, so all of those community of bakers that I had gotten to know over the years started to say, hey, what are you doing with those mills? Are you, are you going to build more? And so I built the first one for uh, my friend Grayson, who had Belgard Bakery done in New Orleans, and then another one in, uh, for a friend out in Victoria on Vancouver Island, and then one after another, the business grew, and now um, we have mill number 200 sitting in the shop right now that's about ready to be shipped out. That's incredible. And right here on the screen, we've got the first slide, which is showing. Um, oh, that's, yeah, this is one of our smaller mills uh, with a 26 inch diameter stone and a sifter attached to it. The hopper, that big funnel. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think after the intros, I'll give a little uh, 101 of stone mill mechanics so we know what we're talking about. Do do we want to do a little one on one right now? Okay. Um, and this is some of the, the other parts of it. This is the. Uh, in order to do this, I had to uh, source granite and. Just so happens that uh, Barry Vermont is well re well regarded for the quality of the granite that they've been quarrying for a couple hundred years, um, and there it shows the the mill uh, disassembled with the runner stone removed. There, the next slide. <clears throat> this next slide is sort of showing some of the uh, geometry of the stone mill uh, of the stones, so how they're cut. Um, and how the dressing is uh, performs in there. Okay. Great. Okay, the next slide and our next uh, speaker will be Aaron Rigsby from Deep Roots Milling at Whitson's Mill in Roseland, Virginia. So the first uh, slide is the mill in all its glory. So Aaron, why don't you tell us about the mill and how you came to it and, and what you're doing there? Hello? Yeah. yeah, it's working. Um, so I'm Aaron Grigsby, uh, and I, along with Ian Gamble and Charlie Wade, run, uh, operate Woodson's Mill, uh, which is one of the last truly water-powered uh, stone mills um, anywhere, really. Uh, there's not that many left um, that, that works, that does production. Um, there's a lot of demonstration mills out there, like uh, Pierce's Mill, some of you were there yesterday. Um, so there's, uh, I guess, as that sort of relates to uh, stone milling and, and this revival of stone mill flour, it's, um, it, it's kind of an interesting place to be in that uh, there's just this uh, kind of massive learning curve 
um, coming coming at it from not even having a background in, in milling um, at all, somewhat uh, somewhat in bread. I was a baker for a few years, um, going back ten plus years ago, um, and just sort of kept up with the with the local grain movement. Um, I remember uh, reaching out to Jen, um, you know, when I was opening a restaurant in Blacksburg and uh, ha having heard that she was milling uh, North Carolina wheat, uh, which was the first you know thing like that I'd heard of any anywhere. So. Um, and I'm sorry, Aaron, if I could just interrupt just a second, I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted to ask, could you describe a little bit of the um, interior machinery you have? Because you have a mixture of both the old and the new. Sure. So just give a rundown and speak a little bit closer to the mic. Just yeah, sure. So yeah, so, um, we, yeah, as Steve mentioned, there is, there is a little bit of a hybrid of old and new. The, the mill itself is outfitted with a, um, what's known as kind of the Oliver Evans system of conveyance. Uh, where you have uh, bucket elevators moving grain around, cleaning equipment. Um, a lot of that we don't currently use, though we're sort of gradually bringing it back as we can. Um, and the, the main of the old equipment, what, what we really lean on is um, the stones themselves and, and, the, and the, you know, the shafts and belts and pulleys that they're connected to. Um, and that is what allows us to utilize the Piney River um, in all of its glory. And, uh, you know, we're able to, uh, just on one set of stones, of which there's two, um, we're still working on, uh, still working on thinking about the other set of stones. Uh, <laughs> we'll get to actually working on them sometime. And you also have a few pieces of modern equipment, too. Um, yes. Hopper, sifter. Um. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's a lot, a lot of the old equipment is still there. We could, completely use the old stuff. There's some limitations with it. Um, so we, you know, we inherited some uh, modern meadow sifters, um, which are, you know, really sort of um, versatile, easy to use, uh, and they fit in well with, with um, you know, the old system that's there. Um, and we use pneumatic uh, conveyance as well. Mm -hmm. um, rather than the bucket elevators, mainly uh, just because of the great, you know, the great task of cleaning um, the, old, the old style of system, which right. I think, you know, maybe back in the day it just didn't get cleaned. Yeah. Is all I can figure. <laughs> yeah. So just to parenthetically insert here, um, Woodson's Mill, the 200 year old structure is on a piece of private property, which, um, actually was bought by a couple. It's come down through the family, families over the years, and the current owners um, are very supportive of what you're doing, but they're not really involved. Um, you all formed your own company, that they formed a private company, an LLC, limited liability company, to market the gr uh, flour that they produce. So that's deep roots milling. So this is a little bit of an unusual situation, but I will say it's, extremely um, important in Virginia because it's the first mill that is really getting back into commerce in a significant way. There are other mills producing some flour for sales, you know, at their front doorstep, so to speak. But I think this is the only one that's actually doing volume business. As far as I know, yeah. um, I guess just to give you perspective, last month we milled uh, Four, uh, seven tons of grain. Seven tons of grain last month. Um, so that, that's there. There aren't really many old mills doing that level of production. And on water power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean the creek, the creek river, whatever. Uh, yeah, the Piney. Piney River. That's amazing. Yeah. And here we have on the screen the um, one of the millstone faces, and that's a person dressing, which means to. Um, sharpen and get rid of imperfections and cracks in the millstone. Very important to get that done. And we'll move to one more slide with millstone, which is uh, the Bloody Butcher corn variety, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, and I just find it fascinating. I've never heard of this before until a couple of years ago. And I made some grits, cornbread, I don't know. Anyway, it was great. So they have that there, right? You have Bloody, 
Do you have Bloody Butcher? Yeah. So we, yeah. When, when we took over the mill three or four years ago, we um, we actually, I guess you could say, sort of inherited a couple of uh, farmers, one of which was um, ah. this uh, gentleman, Jake Garland, yeah. uh, who, whose farm is three miles down the road from the mill and had uh, just developed an enthusiasm for Bloody Butcher corn. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just grows a few acres, does a lot of it by hand. Um, right. And it's a really, really nice product. Yeah. Yeah. And then finally on the screen, the bags of deep fruit smelling um, and what they sell at farmers markets and other places around the region. So thank you, Aaron. Um, next up is Jennifer from Carolina Ground in Hendersonville, North Carolina. And we have um, on the screen. Um, um, so my background, um, I originally was a baker, as Steve mentioned. Um, what got me into milling was my interest in naturally leavened bread that I started in the early 90s. I wanted to figure out how to bake bread without commercial baking yeast and ended up finding my way through a certain lineage of bakers back then that were doing a bread called um, Dazem. It's a Flemish naturally leavened bread. And the first ingredient is um, fresh flour, stone ground flour. So um, I, my first apprenticeship in Arkansas, we were working with Meadows Mills and then I went out to Alan Scott who built the ovens. He also is a Dazen baker and um, he was my mentor. Um, I baked with him. Um, we would bake bread in the wood-fired oven in the backyard and deliver it door to door. <coughs> and, um, and we used a couple different mills, but he had this friend, Roger Jansen, who I mentioned in my talk, who ended up building the mills for my bakery. Um, and so it wasn't, and um, yeah, I think it's really interesting to just kind of reflect for me on those lineages of going from um, it was sort of like starting out really this kind of whole grain baking in the um, macrobiotic world. I mean, even like post World War II. I mean, uh, there was there was a, a lot of really interesting lines that brought it finally back to traditional food, but um, but first coming from like the the days in Flemish baking was sort of mired in, for a while there in the sort of macrobiotic health food scene. I finally got to California to apprentice with Alan Scott. It was like I had arrived into a place that wasn't um, driven by whole grain as health, but whole grain as flavor and tooth and substance and, and bread that had soul and, um, and you know, it, and, and baking in a wood fire and oven was just like, that was like the finishing touch. So I was really focused on the bread and, and the culture. And I remember thinking, because I would mill in the other room while I was, I, like my baker, I'd be sitting at my, before Excel, I was like doing my math for each bake while I was milling in the other room, so I'd hear the mill. And, and I always like in the back of my head thought, like this could be a thing, but never really thought this should be a thing. But, um, but anyways, when this idea for, came up that I talked about, this need to sort of close the gap between farmer, mill, and baker, I, Really, it was the first time that I realized I kind of had this skill that I could utilize. Um, and so I ended up um, with this 48 inch diameter um, Austria roller. It's a mill from Austria. It was actually Alan Scott's mill. Alan had passed away a congestive heart failure. The mill was sitting in a loading, uh, in a holding container in Hobart. It hadn't really officially entered the country yet. And Alan passed away and his daughter reached out and said, your project should take this. So we raised the money and paid the Scott family. But, um, but regardless, that was like sort of how I got my first mill. Um, and, and it was my first introduction to, to sifting, which was like a whole other art form. Um, I, as a baker, I didn't do any sifting. And I felt like, why would we do that to our flour? <laughs> Now I feel a little differently. I'm still when I bake. I'm still like pretty much, you know, I, I'm I'm a whole grain baker. I love 
working with whole grains, but I also think there is like a beautiful art form in sifting, and I love that we can do this and that we can create like gorgeous grades of flour that can really, you know, I mean, especially, you know, I'm not a fan of rolling milk flour. I'm not a fan of white sugar either. So it's like kind of, if we can do this with stone milling and still kind of deliver a nutritive, lower glycemic product that is like really good, then why not, yeah. right? Yeah. So- Jennifer, if you could turn the next page, okay. actually. No, 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 I want to ask you about the, um, just turn the next page, and you will see, okay. yes, this okay. big machine okay. that's on the slide yeah. here, this so, mysterious thing. Right, right. Yeah. what you're looking at, so we have two mills now, we have, um, we have the Osti roller, which comes from Austria, beautiful, this family's been making these mills for over 100 years, and they, it's really a, a lovely mill. Um, but then I remember Dave Bauer showed, gave me some flour from his New American, and I was just like, oh my God, <laughs> this is the whole grain flour I have been wanting to, I have been wanting, because I always felt like we were compromising our whole grain flour. We had one mill, and so we were just like having to, I just wanted the whole grain flour to be the best, but we also had these other orders, so we'd have to get through. So I ended up, after, reaching, after visiting um, Grayson, I was like, he's got two new Americans. I should have at least one. So, <laughs> or did he three? Actually, I think he had three. Yeah, I was like, definitely, I should have one. So, anyways, I ended up ordering a, a meal from, um, yeah, from Andrew, who sat in our hallway for a long time until finally we were able to use it. But what I do with my new American is it sits there and just slowly makes whole grain flour all day while we work the other meal doing sifted product or. We can run them both in concert to do whole grain flour, which leads to this. But um, but I will say, um, Dave Miller, who is a, a baker hero friend of mine out in California, that was like kind of my circa baker who's still baking. He really inspired me with that idea because he has he's a large osteo roller, but it just slowly works in the background doing whole grain flour. So this idea of just being able to like put the whole grain piece on a pedestal like that. Like, we're just gonna not care about yield because, I mean, about like how many pounds per day. I mean, we had certain markers that we need to hit, but like, it's it's a joke to most mills. And what we're good with it, with the production of our new American, because it gets to have five days to do what it needs huh. to do while we're like focusing on the other mill. So what you see here, for eight and a half years, we were milling into eight gallon buckets, like I mentioned, I'm flipping the buckets over. This is, um, oh, okay. it's hard to see from, because you don't see the other part, but our two mills are to the, if you're looking at a screen, that would be to the right. Yeah. Right? Scott? Yeah. Right. So we have our two mills over there. This is delivering the flour to these two tanks. The, um, so the New American is on the right and the Austral is on the left. So both tanks, the flour goes into, and then we have airlocks below that, and then we have, um, we have another, do we have another airlock? I think we should have two airlocks and then um, this and a diverter valve and then a bagger. So we can either dump flour, like if we're running rye, we run it on both mills, airlocks open, we just keep it flowing because rye is super sticky. And But if, but if we're doing like, we'll do like whole grain bread on one mill, the new American and, and high extraction on the Oster roller, and then we'll dump one or dump the other. And so that's our bagging system. So this was like a huge piece that like made our life less dusty, less heavy, um, you know, yeah. So that's Can I ask, is, is there a zero, zero gravity inside the airlock? Sorry, I just had to I don't ask know that. Okay, that. Okay, oh, we're yeah, gonna, we're gonna move on here. Like, totally oh, it's locked enough to take off a couple fingers. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. You it's fantastic. Um, next is Jonathan Bethany from Salu Bakery in Washington, D.C. So I gave you a little background here on Jonathan, but um, Jonathan, you want to talk about your philosophy of um, sourcing locally and encouraging local farmers? <clears throat> thank you, Steve, for inviting me to this panel. Sure. Uh, big thanks to Common Grain Alliance and all of you here who bring your heart and your, and your talents and your enthusiasm to help build this, this movement. And uh, 
you know, we started about the same time as the Common Grain Alliance, and uh, we opened our, our bakery, Salem Bakery Mill, and um, <laughs> it's amazing to be where we are now, and uh, I just want to give space for that. And I'm, I'm just elated and uh, feel a lot of support and a lot of cohesion um, and uh, a lot of hope. So, um, yeah, um, <laughs> that's the kind of feeling to it. Um, I mean, you made so, it through the pandemic for one thing, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, we did. We're Everybody here. Did here. <laughs> We're Everybody here. did. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I had, um, I think, CNN, PBS, and a South Korean channel come to Salu all with the same agenda, I found out later. <laughs> and I learned a little bit about how, how news works. But, uh, you know, they already had the story loaded yes. and uh, just wanted a mouthpiece for it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, basically, a couple of them, they gave, they gave a little forewarning to my wife, but, um, and I probably should have wrote them and just told them don't bother coming. But, um, by the third one, I think it was PBS. I'm like, maybe I can try to give them a little spin. Maybe they'll do a different kind of story. But basically, they wanted me to talk about how bad things were with Ukraine war and pandemic and food, you know, value, you know, food supply, and especially with 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 flour, cost of flour. <laughs> and um, I just didn't have a a very compelling story for them. <laughs> I was like, actually, things are kind of better than they've ever been. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, thanks. it's going, Thank it's going pretty well on the local front here. Um, yeah. You know, I couldn't even find riot last year because, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, people with the pandemic went, went kind of crazy. They didn't recognize that was an angle that you had um, managed to transcend the international market conditions. You know, that would have been an angle. I mean. Really. <laughs> I'm just kidding. They, but they, 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 yeah, they yeah, no, they were stuck on their own. They were a little, you know. Yeah. They were on to the, I think, on to the next, on to the right. next bakery. Right. Um, well, actually, and I just put a new slide here. Um, Jonathan mentioned his wife, and here is Jonathan and his wife, Jessica Aziz, who is a full partner in his enterprise and has a lot of the aesthetics um, that she's applied to the um, interior space there. And why don't you tell us a little bit about um, your all's approach to working as a team on this. It's a very interesting situation. I mean, she is a little busy at the moment with new ch with babies and new children, but... <laughs> Steve, I thought this was a stone milling. Uh, yeah, I know, <laughs> I know, but I, I think the personal stories, the personal stories are always good. <laughs> well, I mean, if you, if you get me... Um, started on uh with my uh, uh my wife I, you know i um first of all i couldn't have done it without her and um you know she really is the half that completes me um in so many ways and i don't mean to get all sentimental but i want to you know she it's it's true um and actually this is a i think it's a segue into the whole local discussion um and that's forging relationships where you have the mutual trust and the mutual vulnerability and you take the, the risk together. And, you know, I think that runs very contrary to some people will say, oh, business is business, just try to get what you can get, just try to get ahead and next thing you know, the world's in flames. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a different approach to uh, to join hands, and it, just like a marriage, it's very difficult too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's where you, that's where you get all the training, all your everything yeah. theoretical becomes practical, and um, you get your character training there. Um, well, for, you put it beautifully. Um, thank you, and I'm sorry if I put you on the spot about that, but I think it's a, a great insight. And it, just finally, here on the screen is some of these incredible pastries that um, Jonathan's. Uh, pastry chef Charbel 
makes, and I'm sure you all probably taste them this morning, but they are extraordinary. And the fact that they're whole grain too, which is something I never had before until I started coming to your bakery, it opened my eyes. Um, so finally, but last but not least, of course, is Ian Hertzmark from the Migrash Farm out in Randallstown. Um, Ian, um, you have 32 acres now, more or less, that you're trying to. Tell us about your 32 acres. Right. Um, Shalom Aleichem. Uh, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Common Grain Alliance. Uh, I am in uh, Baltimore County, Maryland, about 11 miles from the Inner Harbor. Um, we farm 32 acres on a conserved farm, uh, conserved through the MALP program, uh, which is a Maryland state uh, land preservation program. The family that owns the farm hasn't farmed now for three generations and has uh, cycled through commodity grain on this farm. It was much larger at one point. Um, and I'm really on the cusp of the uh, rural <coughs> urban uh, divide line. On one side is Patapsco State Park and uh, the healthiest population of white-tailed deer anybody ever knew about. And uh, on the other side is Randallstown, which is uh, suburban Baltimore. Um, I started farming in 1999 and went through iterations on stone fruit farms out west, uh, vegetable farms in the Hudson River Valley and the Berkshires. And uh, in 2010, I got married and uh, my wife being from this area, uh, basically let it be known that we were not gonna be so far from this area. And, and uh, I found myself uh, in Baltimore and ultimately uh, working as a, uh, a farm educator. I managed a, a farm education program at the Pearlstone Center, which is also in Baltimore County. And um, one thing led to the next, families growing, lots of things happening. Uh, farming seems to not really pay the bills anymore. I become a kosher butcher. Uh, and in a, a fit of clarity, my wife uh, one day tells me that I need to get back to farming. And so 2014, she says, go for it. We'll find this piece of land. Uh, we're currently living in Baltimore, and I'm back and forth between Baltimore and the farm on a near daily basis. And the first season, we put in uh, tons of alliums, tons of uh, tomatoes, and pretty diverse crop. And within three nights, uh, several thousand tomato plants got massacred by the deer. Um, the alliums, between thrips and white flies and whatever else. Uh, so we're kind of figuring out what to do. And I was talking to uh, one of my farm mentors in the area, Jack Gurley of Calvert's Gift Farm. And uh, he just noted that there's a big hole in the local food scene. Nobody's doing grains. Nobody's getting grains to the people. And uh, by that point, um, I guess stepping stepping to the side for a minute, uh, bread and in particular uh, making challah on a weekly basis is a very big part of my life and uh, it's a very spiritual part of my life and my family's life and we sort of revolve around this weekly cycle of the Sabbath and serendipitously they, the two sort of fit together. I planted my very first uh, acreage of red fife in 2015 and it was kind of like an addiction after that. And it had to go from a small little plot to a little bit bigger plot to a much bigger plot to how do you actually make this into the flower that's gonna make the challah that's gonna be on your table every week. And uh, by the middle of 2017, we were selling flour um, at the Baltimore Farmer's mm -hmm. Market under the bridge in Baltimore, Maryland. And, um, just sort of putzing around. I was I was still working uh, in the slaughterhouses producing kosher meat, and uh, I took the chance and I left that and I went full force into uh, into into farming and milling. And uh, all of a sudden the pandemic hits, and we really didn't have a solid plan yet for for all of our milling outlets, but there was a clear need, and it really uh, forced us to put a lot of machine machines online faster than we probably would have. It forced the issue with 
uh, building permits and making sure everything was, was explosion proof and food safe and, and on and on and on. And uh, we entered this bubble of the pandemic and uh, we, we thrived. We, we delivered flour direct to people's homes. Uh, we delivered flour to, to restaurants that were in need. We delivered flour to restaurants so they could resell the flour. Um, and uh, over the course of this period, again, it's a big bubble. And we've got a, a, a new river stone mill that we just purchased and we put online. And we have a, a larger meadows mill that we put online. And, uh, and speaking of that, I'm sorry if I could yeah. just interrupt because on the screen we have one of your um, that's Owen Owen Hubs. What is that? Uh, the the gentleman there, his name is Owen, yeah. and he is standing right next to an eccentric sifter, yes. uh, Meadows eccentric sifter. You can see the the cyclones up above, yes. and it, the the uh, the duct work that takes the flour from the mills into those eccentric sifters. And if you look carefully behind Owen, you'll see one of our Meadows mills. It's a a 20 inch uh, experimental mill that was built sometime in the mid 90s. It's a, yeah. it's a stainless steel mill. Um, and now, is this, I'm, I'm sorry, I just want to ask though, is this um, array of machinery here, is this something that you customized for this space and probably we couldn't see it anywhere else? Right. So, yeah. so being hard headed, we had to force lots of itch issues and to get the mill to, uh, to a, a Bigger space, we we uh, outfitted a 19 excuse me 1865 barn um, on the on the farm, and we built this explosion proof room, and we put it all together. And mm. uh, right now we're we're doing it all with single phase power and and lots of other obstacles to industrial scale milling, but. That's, yeah, that's great. Okay, and I'm ending up here with your beautiful, well, it's actually the beautiful picture from Baltimore Magazine, which featured Migrash in an extraordinary spread um, just a few months ago. The reporter did a fantastic job, I think. Do you think she did? She, she yeah. did. She did a good job. Yes. Okay. Well, great. So we've introduced everybody, and, and now we'll move on to some more specific questions. Um, Let's go back to Andrew of New Stone, New American Stone Mills in Vermont, who is making these incredible machines or uh, sets of equipment. And you just mentioned that your business has been doing well over over two hundred different mills. You've sold, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, what is it that? your customers need most and what are you able to give them just you have a small company but you do a lot of your work on site you could be travel right sure yeah um so having the background of being a, a baker uh turned miller turned mill builder and eventually working with farmers kind of gave me the opportunity to be able to connect a lot of these pieces in person and so a lot of our customers initially were bakers who wanted to mill in house like uh, Jonathan uh, was one of our early mill customers, and, and then uh, Josh from Bolted Bread was another one of the early ones. Um, and so we designed the mills in such a way that um, they were attractive and could be shown off to the public so that you could raise some awareness of the extra effort it takes to mill your flour in-house to try to source it from farmers um, and work with the sort of nuances of, of, of fresh stone ground flour. Um, during the pandemic, similar thing happened with the flour shortages. Um, farmers started calling me all over the place, how fast can I get a mill? I've got a bin full of grain and uh, there's no flour on the shelves. <laughs> how, how can I get a mill and start uh, milling my own flour? And so we got a big bump during that period for farmers who were looking to add value to what they were doing and sell it either directly to bakeries or through a farmer's market or, or some other uh, way of selling. Um, and then the other uh, is more specialized milling, like what, what Jen does with uh, Carolina Ground. Um, she was saying how she integrated one of our mills into their system. Um, Farmer Ground Flour is uh, also a stone milling operation up in Ithaca, New York, and um, <clears throat> they've trying to take, um, trying to find this middle ground between industrial milling and artisan milling and sort of uh, bakery uh, on site milling. Um, yeah. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Aaron, let me ask you a question about the um, role that you play as a miller who's 
course, interacting with farmers and you're buying from them and bringing it in. Um, if you were to have a few words of advice to farmers or what they should know about the milling process and how it fits into what they're doing, what would you tell them? Or what are, what are the chief concerns you may have looking out at, at your farming community right now? Um, I guess a lot of our farmers uh, ask us what uh, what we'd like to see them grow. Um, and that's, that's always kind of a tough question to answer because uh, I, ultimately it's, you know, uh, we're, we're not even the end user, so, you know, there's certain things that we like in a, in a crop. Um, and uh, so, you know, we're, we're always kind of having that back and forth dialogue between, between the bakers um, and, and the farmers, which, you know, I guess is the, the rightful place of the miller. Um, but a lot of times what I, what I end up saying in response is, is um, that I want them to grow uh, what they want to grow. Uh, because we, you know, we, we kind of know like farming, and maybe it's always been this way, but uh, it's kind of a community service. Um, and uh, in that sense, like we're not, while we need, we need something that we can use, we're not trying to push um, you know, we're, we're not trying to push this, uh, this like ideal because mm -hmm. we don't really even know what we need. We're like all kind of figuring this out together. Um, and so, you know, we try and, we try and use, use what we can, like give some guidance and some parameters. And, um, I don't know that there's any one size fits all, like something I can say to you that like, you know, mm -hmm. all farmers need to know when it comes one related thing uh, which I've been asking a lot of people, and I may be looking at it the wrong way, but I, I think about the supply side. In other words, the farmers who are out there who are capable of giving you what you want um, for your customers, in other words. So they want a certain integrity, and their, um, the, the customers for your flour want to know where your their grain came from, where the flour came from. They want to know the processes. they. You. So, from your perspective in Virginia, and you're in Central Virginia, is the supply sufficient? I get a feeling that there's probably a lot of supply out there, but tell me. Um, we, we've yet to be able to source all of our uh -huh. all of our grain from Virginia, much less Central Virginia. Uh, of course, and that, yeah. Is, yeah. that is, you know, sort of a soft goal of ours. I mean, mm -hmm. the bigger goal is, is sourcing it all regionally. And you know, kind of like the mid-Atlantic region. And, and we've been able to do that successfully, but um, yeah, we're, the supply is always a year behind the demand. Mm -hmm. because we're, mm -hmm. we're growing as are, you know, other other businesses that want regional grain. Yeah. And, you know, right now, if I tell a farmer right now that we need, you know, you know X many bushels of, of hard winter wheat, well, it's, it's planting time right now, so we're, it's going to be a while before we see that, and in a year, that number might have moved, yeah. you know. Okay. So. Well, Jennifer, can I ask you the same question in terms of your supply? Um, is the supply side working for you right now? And I, I'll just interject, Jennifer's company, you're privately owned, correct? And you are um, actually the, I guess, the middle person in the sense that you're between the farmer and the baker or the user, right? Um, and that's been successful for you. I mean, it has been, the well, company I mean, is thriving. The mill yeah. is owned by, is the, is, the I'm the majority owner of the mill, yeah, and yeah. I have some investors, but yeah. the bakers okay. and farmers don't right. own the mill, so we're just a mill that is yes. a business. Yeah, okay. Um, so we're getting back to supply. Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, we've been in business for over a decade now, so it's fairly clear what our needs are um, at this point, and I'm not trying to necessarily grow the, the, well, I'm definitely not trying to, I'm not necessarily trying to grow the wholesale end of our business. I wouldn't mind growing the retail end without having to get mechanized. I don't want to be on a grocery store shelf, so I, I want to maintain 
direct to customer, whether it's online or at our pop up markets. But um, so I pretty much know our needs every year. Farmer end is definitely the most vulnerable piece of what we do because with the bakers, I mean, I, I'm in contact with my bakers all the time. Um, they place orders either weekly or every other week or once a month or something. But, you know, we, part of why I don't want to grow the wholesale end, I mean, I'm, I'm slowly letting people in, but it's not that I think that we're like, you know, we don't need the business. It, it's more like I'm trying to keep a balance of what our, what it feels like for all of us who work at the mill. We just want to keep it, you know, and the worst is when like, you have a week where there's not that much going on and the next week there's like more than you can handle. And so just kind of trying to keep it balanced that way. But um, that being said, um, you know, we go through like a truckload of soft wheat a year and a truckload of rye. And then we go through like 10 truckloads of, of hard wheat. So hard wheat is like definitely the driver of what we do. Um, and it is definitely the hardest thing to find, you know? <laughs> so, um, I do have, I mean, North Carolina, we have, like I think I mentioned this in my panel, like we have a pretty strong tradition in growing small grains. Um, I think North Carolina grows more soft wheat than any other southern state. So I was approaching farmers who are, are really growing for the commodity market. Maybe they're, they're in a niche because they're organic, but they're looking for another level of niche. And I'm like, you know, trying to get them to shift over. Hard wheats have about half the yield of soft weeds, which means that my offering twice as much for, for you know, for bushels, it's not, it's not that different. It really, ha the numbers really have to work. And, um, and you know, and it's a long conversation. Like I talk to my bakers all the time. I talk to my growers like three times a year. I mean, sometimes we'll just hop on a call, but it's usually like planting time, just around, you know, spring, and then at harvest, you know, I mean, and because because that's the nature of what we do. Um, and so it's a really long, slow conversation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And yeah, so, you know, this year for the first time in a while, I did come into supply issue. Um, I ran out of hard wheat before I had the harvest. And my ideal situation is I have like a couple months in the in the coffers at harvest, so I don't have to dive in. We had shut down for two months when we moved to our new facility, and I just had, <laughs> I'm like doing a lot, like from the bookkeeping to watch, to like cleaning the toilet, to like dealing with farmers, like, and sometimes milking. So, so sometimes, you know, I kind of knew I'm not buying enough, but I also, uh, we were closed for two months and I just did it wrong. And that was really tough because what ended up happening was I was, I was piecing things together. Like Greg sent down, Tor said to Greg, you know, Jen needs some grain. He, we, somebody called for grain. We have none to get, it's Jen. Send her down three totes. And then, um, who was it, Eric at um, Seneca sent me down three totes. So then I had like two different farms I'm trying to blend with. I'm trying to bake test this. I don't even, just so I could tell my bakers what they need to know. And I don't have enough time before we're through it to tell them like it's, and then you're dealing with harvest. So it's really nice to have enough grain there yeah. that you're not having to like figure things out in real time. You seem like you know what I'm talking about, Dave. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Jennifer, I mean, can I just switch the question a little bit um, onto the question of, you know, we've all heard about, we know in our hearts or our, <laughs> our minds about the reasons for stone ground and how important it is and what it does and how different it is from rolling. I think we, we all buy that. But tell me about the challenges of doing this. I mean, you may not have ever done a roller mill before, but still, um, what are the one or two maybe big uh, uh, problem areas just to warn those who might be want to get into this doing a stone ground milling operation? Well, I would say, from I mean, for us, everything is controlled by temperature. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting because I was a wood fried oven baker. So with that, I was always trying to slowly build the, the heat in my masonry. Um, and with milling, it's just the opposite. I don't want to build the heat in my masonry. Um, I am curious what Anders thinks of this, but I feel like it'd be really challenging to do this on, on any level for production without pneumatic. I, I just feel like pneumatic keeps the dust down, the heat down. Pneumatic. Yeah, like yeah. under pressure of air, because even 
like the first time we opened up our Osti and we were um, using the bucket elevator and there was, and I know Amber had the same experience, there was mold on our stones. It was like, ah, what's going on? Because of course heat causes condensation. So, um, so you know, those little things, like it's hard to, I, I think we're all using air, yeah. 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 And Jonathan, could you, oh, or Andrew, you want to? Well, you're, you're not, but John, you're just doing 100% whole grain and slowly for your operation, right? So in that level, it's probably fine. But... You could use here. Okay. Yeah. Andrew, you're about to, does, does that count as pneumatics, the little fan on my? <laughs> um, yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty low production. You know, we supply a, a, a bagel place down the street and a couple restaurants and just some retail flour uh, in addition to all of our all of our products are with the in-house milled flour, whole grain. And, uh, you know, my HVAC is a mess, I'll tell you that. I, it's just, I, I, right now there's a hole in my ceiling with uh, cardboard boxes nailed, you know, screwed to, to um, close it up. It's been out for months. Not to divert the topic, but I, the dust is, is, is real. And Do you have an industrial air cleaner? I'll send you a link to <laughs> okay. We used to change our filters at our old location on our HVAC every day. Oh. And we used cheap ones so because what was the point of using expensive ones? Every day? Every, every day. Wow. <laughs> okay, well they comprehend that. Uh, Ian, would you talk about the stone grinding, how you find it, and what the challenges are for you? <laughs> Um, we're working at a, I think, slightly smaller scale than uh, Carolina Ground, and it sounds like you have surpassed that deep roots, uh, our scale. And, and so for us, conveyance of actual kernels is sort of our pinch point. Um, there's lots of buckets, lots of schlepping, lots of this and this and this. And, um, and on any given day, you're good for it for a couple thousand pounds. So. Uh, yeah, I think that's a big thing for us in terms of uh, the bigger picture. We operate in Maryland and uh, in, in Baltimore County, Maryland, and it's uh, quite a quite a regulatory environment in which we work. And um, between el electrical certifications for explosion proof, uh, you know, air, it, we just have to circulate our air six times an hour through our facility, and that's how we get through it. Um, uh, various things like this are, are, are bigger uh, stress points, I think. Um, and working in that urban, that urban interface. Uh, we were informed by, by Baltimore County that at one time there were 350 active stone mills in the county alone. Um, we, when we started milling in 2015, we were the first uh, commercial mill in the county in over 40 years. Yeah, and some of the really big regional firms have shut down. Um, Nelson, the Rogers, Wilkins Rogers, or Roger the, Wilkins? the Ellicott City Arden. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's been a kind of a shakeout in that respect. I don't know if that's a little bit of a question. Um, but uh, Andrew, why don't you comment quickly on the, the challenges of the stone? Yeah, so the challenges of stone. Um, this got me a bit thinking about supply. So. Um, when we started stone milling at our bakery, um, I was like, okay, I built the mill, I'm just going to order grain from the farmers, it's going to be no problem. And it turned out to be a really bad year in Vermont, and so the couple of local farmers that were growing grain had no grain whatsoever. So we kind of scrambled and we were like, oh, okay, <laughs> what do we do? So we reached out to some, um, some uh, organic roller mills that, um, that would have grain that was cleaned and specked and ready to go. And for us to get into learning how to stone mill, that was a really nice way to start because we could at least have a material that we knew was consistent. We could figure out how the machine worked and then figure out how to do the bread that we knew. 
Um, but then as we worked with farmers and got sourcing from the Vermont farmers, we had to sort of change our, our sense. So when you're working locally, you can't just have the same spec and the same thing every single year. And so the real challenge of being a stone miller is to take what you can, as much as you can, and figure out how to make the most of it. And you might not be making the same bread every year. You might have to make some cookies some years, <laughs> or you might have to do some other things, but that's really what kind of making the system work is working with, with what we have available and kind of honoring the work that farmers are doing by taking this risk to try to grow grains on a small scale. And let's see, um, any other comments on challenges of stone ground? Um, Aaron, how has it been It since? You're working with older stone, I mean, with um, traditional uh, yeah. poor stones from maybe Virginia. I mean, they might have been quarried. Yeah, they, they, as far as we know, they came out of Brush Mountain. Yeah, Brush Mountain was a huge quarry for And I think the stones. only one to bet. The only one. At the time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, there's, there's been a lot of challenges, a lot to learn. Um, you know, uh, when we started, none of us had ever dressed a millstone before. Um, you know, we pretty quickly learned that uh, that no one at that mill had dressed in mill stuff in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you guys are doing personal dressing there, right? We are, yeah. Yes. And actually, we one one of the first things we did when we decided we wanted to do that actually was call Andrew, uh, and he, you know, uh, very gratefully talked to us for like an hour or two, mm -hmm. you know, about what he knew and. Uh, the disclaimer that it may not apply to what we're doing. Uh, <laughs> I mean, but, there are professional dressers out there, right? A couple of them? No. Really not uh, anymore? People. Yeah. Gentleman by the name of Hank Duncan. Yes. Uh, who was traveling, a tra traveling mill right? Yes. Yeah. He hasn't been traveling for the past few years. Yeah. Uh, well, Andrew, this is an interesting question because uh, just to get into it now, obviously dressing and, and Keeping care, taking care of those stones is very important. So, what do you recommend people do? You, you have two hundred customers now, so you can't run around and do it. <laughs> um, yeah. So, briefly, what stone dressing is is when you're using natural granite stone um, as opposed to a synthetic stone like an, an osteoroller mill. The stones dull over time, um, and so the surface needs to be roughed up again with a with an air hammer and a carbide. Uh, it, that looks sort of like a, uh, like a meat hammer. Um, and so this ones have to be re roughed up and then also true to one another so that they're running very, very tight uh, tolerances. So um, I had to sort of teach myself how to do it. I also talked to Hank Duncan a little bit um, uh, about what his process was, but um, a big part of my role is to go around to conferences like this and lead stone dressing workshops. Um, but I also go and visit a lot of customers, and whenever I do that, I'll try to bring in as many other uh, people who are milling in the area and do sort of a workshop so that we can teach, um, so that I can teach bakers, they can teach the other bakers, and sort of this knowledge of how, how, to, how to maintain your stone mill is spread. Um, it's not a proprietary thing. I'm happy to teach anybody who needs to know how to do it. Jennifer, you had a comment? Oh, I was just going to say, you know, when I had my bakery, Roger Jansen, who I mentioned in my talk, um, used to come dress my stones. Um, he was like a third grandfather to my daughter. He would, you know, he would come stay with us and dress the stones in the mill. And then his son, Tass, um, Roger since passed away actually this year, April 15th. Um, he was 91. Um, Tass, his son, um, dear friend, I've known him, you know, since I got my mill from them, um, has been helping me as my mill right with Carolina, in fact, Tass and Andrew co led a workshop at, um, at Carolina Ground Bread Fest, which was really cool. Um, but Tass, like myself, is in his 50s. He's getting close to 60, and he's like, man, this is a lot of my body, and, and we need to teach somebody. So we're about to um, dress the stones, because, um, yeah, 
we're about to dress as Jones of the New American um, no, next month, and I, I, I had a feeling I knew, I was like, I don't know who to do this to. So I reached out to a friend who's a baker who I thought might want to learn this skill, and he does. And so we're really excited because we're going to teach this guy, John, who is, actually works with Flat Rock, and he's been one of the people that has tested our flour for years. And I was like, and he, and he built ovens, he built a wood fired oven for us, so I knew he'd jump at it. So that feels like stewardship, like we're going to get to pass this on, and then I can hire him to come, you know, to come dress our stones. So I think that's part of it is like, like what you're doing. It's just like making sure that, and Roger felt very strongly about this, that we need to teach this, um, this craft or this, you know, this is a tool, this is an important skill to know because when one of his beefs when he worked at Meadows was that they didn't teach it and people would have to send their stones in and they're really heavy. And he's like, why, we need to know how to do this ourselves, so. Great. Well, thank you. That That is great to hear all of that. And uh, I think it's time we move on to Q&A. So um, please don't be shy. I think, is there a microphone for this? Or will we have to use one of these, I guess? Or you can just shout. Actually, I think the acoustics in here aren't that bad. OK, you in the back there, yes. Yes? Thank you for your presentation. We try, we try to keep oily seeds out of our mills as much as possible. Yeah, there's certain, there's certain things that don't mill well in a stone mill, but um, I get emails every few weeks from somebody basically saying, will your stone mill grind this? And so I almost thought I should start a YouTube channel and get an extra mill and just say, will it grind or will it mill? <laughs> Everything from dried mushrooms, people have asked me to do. Um, tahini mills, that would mill sesame seeds, um, chocolate mills. Um, yeah, there's a tradition of using stones to mill all kinds of products for years. Um, yeah. Other uh, comments or questions? Yes. Good luck with that. I don't know how to dress this one. I don't even know what the stones look like. Like, I have screens. I don't know how to get more. Sorry, I was a joke, but. <laughs> they are, they, they're, they do a beautiful mill. Yeah. And they're very, they do not really communicate with, but I do know who just brought one in. I would find out who was in the, did, didn't you guys just, bring, okay. She should call you guys to see if you guys can get the attention of Heidi. Main grades. Okay. Main grades. So a couple other little plugs here. Um, Aaron and I are both on uh, something called the Craft Miller's Guild, and it's just sort of oh you are too yeah. Um, and so uh, it, it was sort of a chat group that it started a while back, um, and now they've officially launched a website um, and are encouraging people to join, and it's. Um, you know, uh, recording a lot of the conversations that the group has had over several years and trying to take all of this information about what we're talking about, how to start a stone mill or how do you get this piece of equipment or how do you fix your stone mill um, and, and making that a shared resource to anybody who wants to join. The other thing that uh, I was part of is um, the Northern Crops Institute is a, a part of North Dakota State University. And um, they have one of our mills there, along with a whole lot of other uh, milling and grain processing equipment. And we've worked to produce a webinar series as, and are producing a handbook as well um, that'll be available for sale. And those are really good resources to sort of uh, put down a lot of this information that's being passed amongst people, people like this, but uh, make more accessible to more people as they get into stone milling. Um, and to, depending on where you're located, um, we might be able to find somebody else who has a roller mill nearby and could pick the brains. Could, 
Could you repeat the, the last um, you know, thing you were referring to? I'm sorry. The, the, the Northern Crops, Crops Institute? I'm sorry, the what? The Northern, Northern Crops Institute. Northern yeah. Crops Institute, and where is that? It's part of North Dakota State University in Fargo. And as far as the Craft Millers Guild, there's there's two tiers of membership there for both professional and home millers. So, um, and it is I think it's pretty economical to join as a, as a home miller. And the conversations over the past couple of years are really well cataloged by topic. So um, you'll definitely find conversations on there of people that have Aussie rollers talking about similar things. So. Okay. Yes. Hang on just a second. I just wanted to repeat the question, which was certified organic and the. Tell me again exactly the que precise question. Well, so I'm curious both about the, the appetite. The appetite for. But also what the process is for that final product. Yeah. Sort of so, product. so what is the consumer demand for certified organic right now? Um, Ian, you want to start? Uh, every few months we run the numbers to see if uh, certified organic handling actually makes sense in and it still doesn't make sense for us. Um, in terms of being a grain handler uh, and being a certified organic grain handler, there are ways that you can, as a handler, process both organic and non-organic grains. And there are specific SOPs that you would adhere to. Um, it seems to be a market-driven thing. And for a lot of us who are direct marketing and looking our customers in the eye, they don't necessarily need the, the organic symbol on there um, if they know the actual farm that it was grown on. So I think there's a scale a, a scale dependency there. Anybody else? Oh, um, on? Yeah, we just we work with solely certified organic growers, and well, actually, we just brought on one grower who's not certified, so it's going to kind of. But he, I know he's not using chemicals, and I'm really interested to understand his process. I honestly think he's beyond organic, but I I'm going to visit him and understand this. Our seed cleaner is the pinch hold for us, but but he treats our stuff as if it's organic. They used to be the cert certifier before I went to USDA, it was Foundation Seed did the certifying. <coughs> so, um, and Charlie and I were talking about them getting certified organic so that we can get certified organic. The cost is scary because we're already paying a goodly amount for our cleaning. Um, and so I'm not sure it's, you know, it's, it's a funny one, because yes, you're right. It's kind of, it's a marketing thing, and we're not putting ourselves in a grocery store shelf, but I also know as a consumer, like, I want to know, and, and not that certification is covering everything. There's plenty of things in there that got through, thank goodness, not as many things as I wanted to get through, but, um, but just sometimes it's, it's really nice to know. I don't have to worry about it, and for me, all my growers are certified organic it's because i don't want to get up in their grill i just want to know that they've done it and this one grower i want to work with him and i want to get to know him and that's like and i'm willing to even if we went got certified organic i'm excited to have the opportunity to tell his story and do what you're saying is like okay i'll treat this differently but i'm going to tell this story because i'm pretty sure it elevates the other stuff so and, and the bakers want organic flour but they know me and they trust me so one other important part of that is that in order to get more organic growers, we have to give some help to transitional growers because of the several years it takes to transition from a conventional system to organic. Um, and so we've worked with a couple farmers in Vermont who um, either, we prefer to buy all organic um, certified, but we also know our farmers. And if we can say, I'm on this new field, um, it hasn't been sprayed, we're not putting any fertilizer on it, it's not certified, but you know, this is how we're treating it, then, then we're happy to buy it and try, and try 
pass that information on to our customers as well. And then we also have had to find um, other outlets for uh, a new uh, farm that was transitioning from his parents that were conventional dairy farmers and wanted to grow grain organically. And so you know, we developed the pizza dough line um, that we would sell and say, this is, this is transitional. And so you gotta kind of bring, bring everybody along so we can have the things move towards a better way. Other questions, yes. Um, so all of you as buyers of local grain and, and often premium you know, levels of, of uh, price points for growers, what are the, a few things that growers can do to make your life easier or make, make our products more attractive? Um, what are your wish lists from local growers uh, in terms of this, you know, the supply that's coming in to your facilities? Grain quality, yeah. grain quality, uh, dry grain, plump kernels. Please set your combine fans very high. Uh, we trash in there. And crop rotations that that yeah, like you guys are doing. <laughs> Good crop rotations that'll build the soil will equate to the grain that we're looking for. Yeah, uh, keep keep insect infestations under control because you know once that once that gets out of hand, it's really hard to hard to get rid of. I'm sorry, what were you referring to? It, insects. Insect infestation. Yes. Yeah. yeah, like cleaning out your bin completely at harvest, and you know, just really good housekeeping because that will do a lot just to make sure that you don't perpetuate an issue the next year. The one thing we said about dry grain, so. In Vermont, when they're harvesting, um, because of the rainy seasons and stuff, um, sometimes when the grain is close to ready, but maybe not dried down enough, um, the farmer's just gonna have to go combine it and get it out of the field, because if a big thunderstorm comes through, it could flatten it and you know, ruin everything. So sometimes they're harvesting at 20 to 19% moisture, which is way too high for storage. And so Many of them have rigged up different types of grain drying equipment to be able to dry the grain as it's coming off the, the combine so it's ready for storage. And you know, we like to see stuff at 13% or below um, in order for it to keep throughout the year. Yeah. On the note of insect infestation, what, what pets are you guys seeing most often? What tricks have you done to keep them under control? Keeping insects under control is the question. <laughs> I saw my first granary weevil when I was a baker, and he looked kind of interesting. I was like watching him walk by, and he just like seemed like he knew where he was going. Was like, yeah. And then like the next year, he had a friend, and I was like, oh, this is interesting. And then the third year, I opened up a bag of kamut, and it was like I fell back. You know, it was just like ah, oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> So, how do, you, how do you deal with that? Well, you don't do, I mean, it's all about avoidance. It's all, I mean, not like mental avoidance. I just ignore it. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not happening. No, it's all about keeping the problem from happening in the, I mean, in the first place. You come to my mill and, like, I'm about to buy a vacuum cleaner that's, like, so expensive. <laughs> and I already have two expensive ones, and this one is, like, but I'm, like, I'm always cleaning. I... I do two things to keep to store our grain. I just started doing modified atmospheric packaging, so because I get everything off farm, and we try and move it as quick as we can. So get it off farm to the cleaner to our facility. Um, so this is the first year I got to do this. So half of it went into. Um, they all come out in totes, and we um, pulled the oxygen out, put CO2 in. So we're using hermetic seal to you know to. And it's not to kill the bugs. The bugs should not exist at that point. It's to keep it from hatching. Um, and then the other half is going to the freezer because I just don't have that much storage. And so I could try and clean out that freezer as soon as I can. But that's, I used to be all freezer because I had grain come into the mill room once that had a certain smell to it that I didn't know what that was until I had um, the FDA come in and do an inspection. And then the next day my miller called me. She's like, you got to get over here now. It's like they land. It was like a task force had landed. It was like a drug bust. I mean, they were like in every tow with a flashlight. It's too bad Jerry um, Newman is in here because he 
Anyways, he, he remembers the story. <laughs> we had, he's the only one that we had sent flowers. It was a lesser borer beetle. That smell was the smell of the lesser borer beetle. And it, and it goes, and it comes out of the germ. And luckily, they're pretty easy to kill with, with cold, but I dove into the research that is all out there in the land grant universities of how long, at one temperature, can you kill any eggs that exist in grain. Um, I don't know yet, and I'm still, um, if, if CO2 hermetic affects germination, I know that freezing doesn't. So I like the idea of having half of it still go to the freezer as I understand this process better. But, um, you know, if you have a toe to grain and you put your arm down in there and you feel some heat and moisture, you've got a bug issue. And you just can't, it's like, it's, it's going for it. Of course, the bugs are smart. They're like, give me the nutrients and flavor. They go right for the germ, the, the vitality of your grain. And, and you don't want them in your facility, so. Yeah. Um, well, I think we're running out of time, but let me just say one uh, thing, just to sum up here. Uh, <laughs> no, I was um, intrigued to learn about the Craft Milling Guild that has just started. Um, and, you know, this is significant because um, currently there's something called the Society for the Preservation of Old Mills, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. It's called Spoon which is all fine and good, and we've worked with them, and of course it's very important to preserve these old mills, but the fact that there is a craft milling guild now means that this is real-time use of the mill or mills, and that is the significance, and so that's what I want to leave you with today, that, that you all are the future here. I hope you can use both the old and the new, but um, I think we're primed for a, um, a new era. And the future is now, as we said. Okay, thank you.